Hi. Um, so I work for Oracle. Um, <laughs> last, last year I, I was here working for Microsoft. Um, <laughs> You know, actually, that, that isn't the sentiment that I, that I had gleaned about Microsoft today, actually. I mean, everyone loves Amazon because Amazon's spo sponsoring the party tonight. Yay. And uh, everyone's pretty much okay with Google having access to all of our data. Um, but um, <laughs> for some reason, people don't seem to like Oracle all that much here. You're, you're catching on. All right. Um, so Oracle's a big company. We've got 137,000 employees, $180 billion of market capitalization. I can't even visualize $180 billion. That's just ridiculous. Oh, good for you. Uh, so, but Oracle, Oracle's not just a big company, it's a cloud company. We don't just do a database. We don't have 137,000 people working on the database. Um, and our, our competitors, the people who, who I thought you were all happy about, they, they have their own databases too. Uh, Microsoft, of course, has uh, MS SQL. Um, Amazon have nine different databases on their cloud, RDS, Aurora, Redshift, and more. Um, some of them are based on Postgres, but uh, Amazon's not exactly a big contributor back to Postgres yet. I went to look at Stephen, uh, Stephen Frost's uh, con uh, a GitHub repository with all, all the Amazon patches, and there's uh, none in there. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know whether that's accurate, but... Uh <laughs> <laughs> um, Google's got at least five, um, and, and including some NoSQL options like BigQuery. Uh, but competition is good, right? I mean, we, competition drives innovation. You know, if if, if um, MySQL weren't around, you guys would be nowhere without them driving you to to be better and and actually keep hold of people's data. Um, but the important thing is that competitors can collaborate. Um, just just because the Oracle database competes with Postgres does not mean that we're enemies. We're co we're competitors, right? And, and the, the important thing about competition is, you know, you kind of need a level playing field. And, f and for, for us, really, that's SQL, right? We, we all implement a slightly different variation, slightly different dialect of SQL, but uh, at least everyone who implements SQL is a competitor. We can compete for people. You can migrate from one database to another with mm, minor adjustments to people's code. <laughs> All right, you're laughing, but it's a lot easier than going to a NoSQL model, right? You know, um, the, the Bruins and the Blues are literally trading punches on the ice, but they're all members of the NFL, uh, NHL Players Union. Um, and <laughs> yesterday, an Oracle employee uh, loaned an, a an HP HDMI adapter to an Amazon employee who plugged into his Apple laptop to give a presentation. Now. That's a standard, right? That, that, that's goodness, right? We all benefit from having those kinds of collaborations. And so I don't actually work on the database myself, uh, obviously. Um, I'm a Linux kernel guy. And it turns out there's about 150 people in Oracle's Linux kernel team. And we work on all kinds of things which benefit Linux broadly. We, we have our own internal projects, of course. But, you know, we do, we do QA on the Linux kernel, which just helps everybody. Um, I mean, I, I, I suspect most of you work on Linux-based systems. I, I know there's a couple of FreeBSD people in here, but um, by and large, most people are using uh, Linux today. We have security people. We do RDMA stuff, which is very important to some databases, less so to others. Um, personally, my, my, my thing at the moment is memory management. I swore I would never do memory management, but here I am, breaking my, breaking my own promises. Um, so what I'm working on right now is huge pages. Um, if you're not you know, in, into the low-level details of, of, of kernels and, and microarchitectures, you probably don't know a whole lot about them. But um, Postgres has had support uh, for huge pages using something like huge TLBFS or Shumget or something uh, for a couple of years now. Um, but what I'm working on is uh, transparent fileback pages. And we're going to see a 2 to 6% performance improvement um, and you guys are going to get that for free, right? You're not, you're not doing anything for that. We're doing it. We're doing it not for you. I mean, there's nobody at Oracle who wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to make Postgres 2 to 6% faster today. But we do, say, we do wake up in the morning and say, hmm, how can I improve Oracle database performance? And then you guys get the benefit of it for yourselves. So thank you for coming. Please don't kill me. And if you are going to pour your drink over me, the official Canadian way is to have me open my mouth, lay down on my back, and pour it very, very slowly, a few milliliters at a time. Thank you. For
Sorry. <clears throat> Hi. So I'll start right in the middle. Um, I uh, want to talk about PG Bouncer wrapper, um, SQLizing PG Bouncer. Um, who all has used PG Bouncer before? Okay. Who loves that console? <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's there's always a few. Um, not everybody does, and I wanted to uh, uh, give some alternatives. But uh, for those that haven't always used PG Bouncer, one of its awesome properties is that it can pause a Postgres database. It sort of just gives you a, a way to uh, um, do things in the background without necessarily taking an outage and violating your SLA. Uh, that is pretty nice. Uh, this is not. Anybody remember? Anybody seen something like this? It's a uh, show users on a uh, busy um, uh, PG bouncer, and it's uh, a little hard to deal with, and it's a little hard to scroll through, and there's just not a whole lot of there there, or, or I should say, there's way too much there there, and there's not a lot of usable information. Um, so. Uh, it's just too much. Um, so this is where I go to the live demo. There we go. <coughs> so, uh, thanks. Um, so, uh, thank you. Um, So let's, uh, let's have a quick look at some of the things that we could do from PG Bouncer wrapper that you really can't do from PG Bouncer itself. So uh, here I'm doing a little SQL on these table-like things. And uh, up, comes, uh, uh, up comes the, uh, the, the, the actual thing that you wanted, um, even though in the original table-like thing, this information wasn't there. So you can do joins, all that kind of fun stuff. I don't think I need to convince anybody here that SQL is fun to play with. Uh, let's see what else we can do. Um, oh, just uh, th this is just a bunch of views laid atop of the uh, show commands. And if you were wondering about the rest of the uh, verbs, here they are. Oops. Uh, there was uh, there. There's a disable and an enable and a kill and a pause and all these things and you can call them from SQL, um, and that's the end of the live demo. Let's see if I use the right mouse. Alrighty. Uh, does anybody want to hear about the history of, uh, of uh, PG Bouncer? Too bad. It comes from Skype. <laughs> they made Sky Tools, of which uh, PGQ, Londista, Wall Manager, and of course, PG Bouncer um, are, are, are uh, parts. Um, I'd like to thank them for being able to do this. I'd also like to thank my employer, One Login. Uh, um, I'd also like to thank Joe Conway for DBLink. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for your patience. Thanks so much. This this one? Oh, wait, do I do it? I got to? Well, it's basically uh, uh. Sorry. Oh, okay, fine. Got it. And this one? This is for the room? Our this next wait. speaker is uh, Jonathan Katz. He's going to talk about programming. Thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Katz, as Magnus said, and today we're going to tell MD5 to scram. In New York we tell MD5 to do something else, but then it's not as funny in this context. <laughs> so first, before we start, let's have a, a brief history of Postgres password management, because today we're going to be talking about password-based authentication, which is something we do every day. So before Postgres 10, there were two methods. One was called password, which stored the password as plain text in the database. And this is totally fine if you basically trust a lot of different people who are interacting with your system. And of course, we all do. And of course, you never repeat your passwords ever. And there actually was a legitimate reason to use this method, which was that your, you know, your, your driver, your library did not support the MD5 method. But this is no longer relevant because we do not support this method anymore. But we do still support MD5, and this was a very popular, well, yeah, it was a very popular way to uh, do password-based authentication in older Postgres, which basically, you took uh, a password, then you took a salt, which happened to be your username, you threw it in, I call it Postgres MD5, which is the MD5 hashing algorithm with MD5 prepended to it, and that was it, and that's how you stored it. And, you know, this is all in, all in well. And then when you said, like, hey, I want to connect to Postgres, Postgres would say, all right, well, I got, I got you know, to challenge you, so here's a random four-byte salt, which basically, what you would do is you take that MD5 password and pre-compute it, attach the salt, put it through the Postgres MD5 again, and then the Postgres server would do the same exact thing and say, all right, cool. But the problem is, is that that kind of salt had like, almost like no randomness, because if you use the same username and password for everything, you basically have the, the same salt for everything, sorry, the same MD5 hash for everything. But it's not like you can get that very easily because there's no way that information could be you know, given to you. And you, know, you probably couldn't just like, take that authentic authentication method and use it you know, anywhere. So it's totally secure. Good. So MD5 needs to scram. Or as we say in New York, something else. But scram seems, it seems kind of rude, but it's not. It's actually the salted challenge response authentication method. And it's a standard. And it's a very well-defined standard. And what's also cool is it's actually pretty easy to implement, as evidenced because I've impl implemented it independently. Um, the thing that's so cool about it is that it defines a way that your client and server can authenticate with each other without ever sharing the password. Really, all you need to do is you need to store something like this, or this is what Postgres stores, which is the digest you want to use, the hashing algorithm, the number of iterations you put your password through the hashing algorithm using a, an HMAC-based uh, signing, uh, the initial salt that you want to use, because we always need a salt, and then you have something called the stored key and a server key, which we'll touch on, but the client can be blissfully unaware of this, except for when uh, you do any initial generation. So how do we scram? Let's see if I can do this in one minute and 58 seconds. Client says, I want to connect. Postgres is like, all right, but you got to scram. So I'm going to send you the, the, the hashing digest for you to figure that out. The client is like, well, the client can either say, well, I don't actually support this method and goodbye, which is now far less of a problem than it used to be. Or the client can say, great, well, let me send you some channel binding information, which we'll touch on later. The username, which Postgres completely ignores because it already knows your username. And then a nonce, you know, a single, one-time, randomly generated piece of garbage. The server is like, okay, so you really want to scram? It's great. So I'm going to actually append to that nonce, so that way, you know, we know that we're communicating with each other. I'm going to send you back the salt and the number of iterations you need to put your plain text password into. Well, we've already give, we've supplied the plain text password on the client side, but we don't ever want to send that over. So basically, we do some hashing magic to generate what we call a client proof. And because you can all read this very quickly, you can see that we can generate this client proof. And you have to trust me when I say that we're never sending the password over. We basically just send back the nonce and uh, how we get the client proof. The server then says, all right, well, let me validate if you can actually, you know, if the proof you sent to me is valid. And the idea is that both of them, sh you know, effectively derive the stored key. And they both derive the same stored key, then they're likely valid. But of course, you know, there's a few other things that we check. But the server now knows at this point the client is valid, but the client does not not necessarily know like the server is valid and the server has the correct stored key. So the server has to send back a signature for the client to validate to say like, hey, everything is okay. So there's a method to upgrade to scram, basically um, set password encryption to scramshot256, 
Um, you leave MD5 based auth enabled in pghba.conf until everyone's uh, rehashed their passwords. Uh, there's channel binding. It helps prevent man in the middle attacks. And we did that in five minutes. <laughs> Hello, can you all hear me? Yeah. All right, uh, so uh, this uh, short presentation is gonna be about uh, HIGO Software Incorporated in Canada. Um, just wanted to take this opportunity to announce that uh, we are creating a small team uh, for PostgreSQL community development, and that team is gonna be based in multiple, multiple geographical locations. <coughs> so the primary function of that team is going to be working uh, doing community development, so they'll be working on new features and other community activities. Okay, so who am I? Uh, my name is Essen Hadi. I've recently taken on a job of uh, VP of development with Hygo Software. Prior to that, I was working for Enterprise DB for about 15 years as the senior director of product development. Okay, so uh, uh, can I get a show of hands of people who have heard about HIGO software before this presentation? Okay, <laughs> so we've got a few there. So HIGO software incorporated in Canada is a subsidiary of HIGO software that's based out of China. That's our parent company. And uh, HIGO software is um, the biggest uh, Postgres shop in China. They've got about 300 employees. And um, you know they are the biggest. Uh, you know they're kind of leading the PostgreSQL development and promotion of Postgres in that region. So that's uh, Higo China. There are some couple of other random pictures of uh, Higo China. Got one more slide here. So this is all Higo China. All right. So uh, Higo China. Um, you know they are also a core part of uh, PostgreSQL Association in China, which is uh, made under uh, Kupu, which is. Uh, China Open Source Software Promotion Union. So you can see a uh, list of all the other members that are part of that association. I can only read a few from there, so I guess you probably do the same. So this is another flyer of China PostgreSQL Association that you can read. Okay, um, there is uh, uh, the HIGO, HIGO Software China has done some work, um, you know, some open source work, so they've got couple of tools out there. Uh, one of them is Xlog Miner. Uh, it's a tool for uh, wall parsing. Then there is a PG Lite tool, which is a light lightweight backup tool. Uh, these tools are still kind of work in progress, so there's more work to be done uh, before we get them to production quality, but uh, they're all available on GitHub, and they've been done by the HIGO China team. So this is the uh, HIGO uh, Software Incorporated China Canada office. So we've got, uh, we've got, a, we've got a few employees in our Canada office. Uh, this is uh, another picture of our office in Canada. <coughs> then this is uh, HIGO Software Incorporated Office in Pakistan. Uh, we, do, we don't actually own the whole building. We just have a small office in that building. But one day we hope that you know, we can have a building like that. So I think to some people's surprise, um, you know, HIGO uh, Postgres is also very popular in Pakistan. Uh, we've got at least uh, four companies in Pakistan, Postgres companies in Pakistan that have their development office. Um, and um, you know, Postgres is also very popular in the government sector. Uh, the National Identity Card is uh, basically, um, you know, they are using Postgres, and you know, every citizen of Pakistan is supposed to have a National Identity Card. So Postgres is actually getting very popular in Pakistan, and they also have, um, you know, development is happening there as well. So uh, in terms of uh, you know what we plan to do as part of this uh, team that we are putting together. Um, you know, for Postgres community development, you know, obviously you want to start with things like patch reviews, blogging, you know, maintenance, bug fixing, obviously translations, you know, appearing and talking in conferences. That's kind of our, you know, short-term plan. In the long or medium term, you know, we're looking at doing some development in areas like backup performance, scalability, you know, uh, horizontal scalability, uh, vertical scalability. Uh, we also want to do some work in the security area, and there are also some projects that we plan to undertake uh, under the R&D banner. So uh, that's kind of our medium long-term plans. Obviously, the areas that I've talked about, uh, we are not restricted to work in just those areas. So you know, if there are 
suggestions uh, from the community members. We are welcome to those suggestions, and you can contact, contact us. Okay, so this is the last slide. Uh, we are uh, HiGo is also hosting uh, a PostgreSQL conference in China in Beijing in July, and uh, we're expecting around uh, two to three hundred people. And uh, we would just uh, encourage everybody to attend uh, that conference. It's going to be a great conference. And my friend Grant here, uh, who's uh, organizing it, can give you all the details. And if you don't find that enticing enough, there's going to be a trip to one of the mountains in in Beijing as well. Thank you very much. That work? All right. From New VM. So yes, I'm Chapman Flack, and for a few years now, I have been maintaining the PL Java extension. There's a story behind that. No, let me touch on it this way. Um, if you picture sort of the design of a typical PL extension. Uh, you've got Postgres here on one side of it. There are some constraints. It has certain APIs it exports, and you know you don't get to change SQL. You've got your programming language over here that you're going to use. You don't get to change its spec. You do get to design all of this stuff in the middle, how you're going to embed this thing, um, what you're going to do, what PL types you're going to use for what SQL types, how you convert from one to the other. Um, the easiest answer is probably, well, I'll use the simplest PL types around. Maybe I'll use strings. I will call the Postgres data type in-out routines and, you know, done 40 lines. Um, PL Java is a funny case because even this stuff in the middle is pinned down by formal specs. So SQL part 13 tells you what these details have to look like. It tells you how you're going to do the data type mapping, which has to be the same way it's done in JDBC, which is more than 40 lines. And uh, that's, it makes it convenient for using PL Java. You've got these nice Java types. They have useful behaviors. You get them without much work. Um, for hacking on PL Java, it turns it into this game where you're trying to satisfy four different specs at the same time. Um, and that was the same sort of thing that got me my unofficial title in a lab in grad school of the Gloomeister. Um, and that might be why when I started sending, you know, early patches to Thomas Hallgren for PL Java, he was ready to spend his next 10 years doing something else. <laughs> and <laughs> he said, oh look, here's the right kind of weirdo. And so here I am, and I've done a few releases since then focused on uh, not breaking things while getting enough familiarity to jump into more ambitious changes. And some of those are forced by JDBC as it continues to evolve. Um, PL Java originally kind of has assumed that in the C code it knows what data type transformations it's going to need to make. It can have those all teed up before the Java code needs them. Meanwhile, JDBC keeps adding support for new Java types, some of them as uh, alternate mappings of the same SQL types. So it no longer makes sense to assume you know what to tee up in advance. That took some hammering and bending in PL Java 1.5.2, um, and we'll get some more work in a, a major release down the road. Um, I promised I would say something about Graal VM, which is this Oracle Labs ETH Zurich um, quest that they've had for several years, and it just 11 days ago had its first non-pre-release release. Um, they don't do it for us, but competitors can collaborate. And uh, it's a polyglot VM. It runs Java, JavaScript, R, Python, Ruby, LLVM, Bitcode. You can compile stuff from C, um, other uh, JVM languages. And it does all this with very little cost for interlanguage calls and actually interlanguage data accesses. Um, and beneath all of that, um, it is still a JVM. 
Uh, if you have PL Java installed in your database, you can change the setting of libjvm location to where you've downloaded Graal VM. The next session that starts up with PL Java will be running on Graal VM. Um, you can create uh, Java functions the same way you're used to, and now these functions can use the Polyglot API and do stuff in other languages. What you can't do at this point is uh, create language, create function in those other languages and use those directly from SQL. For that, you're going to want me to finish the changes on the data type mapping that I alluded to earlier. And uh, if anyone has questions in 18 seconds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is hey. Present, I guess, else's talk? Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm Özgün. I'm with uh, Microsoft slash Citus Data, and today I'm going to talk about PG Auto failover, uh, a Postgres solution for automated failover and high availability. And it was actually Lucas who was going to present this talk, but his flight got cancelled. He got stuck in New York, and he called me up and said, "Hey, Özgün, can you present in my place?" And I asked. I, I told him, "Hey, oh, sure. Uh, what do you want me to do?" He said. We just open source this extension, uh, and uh, PGCon is a critical audience. So I'd like to, I'd like for you to talk about it and under promise and over uh, like uh, over deliver later. So keep it modest. And I said, sure, Lucas. And I decided to go ballistic. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> PG Auto failover is the best HA solution there is ever. Uh, not just for Postgres, for any uh, database really. And if you don't like the framing, uh, Lucas is flying here. He'll be here in about an hour or so. Uh, please share your feedback with him. And if you can't find him, he's the tall Austrian guy. Uh, I have his cell number too. <laughs> and on a more serious note, uh, PG Auto Failover is an auto failover solution for Postgres. And uh, why another auto failover solution, high availability solution? It's the combination of three things uh, that make PG Auto Failover unique. It's simple. First and foremost, uh, robust and open source. And when I say simple, uh, like no external dependencies. You can download this thing uh, without anything else, set it up and uh, run in eight steps. It's robust, fairly well tested, and there's a finite state machine that manages state transitions. And uh, we recently open sourced it under the Postgres uh, license. It's very new, and then the primary reason I'm presenting here is to gather your feedback into the extension and solution. Here's a simple architecture diagram. Uh, basically, you have the primary that does the streaming replication to the secondary, and then we have a monitoring node in there. And the monitoring node is the author like authoritative node that manages the state and then the state transitions between the primary and the secondary. So in this picture, if your primary fails, uh, the monitor does health checks regularly and at some point decides to promote the secondary. If your secondary fails, uh, the monitor node again uh, intervenes and then does the right thing. And if the monitor node fails, uh, then as long as you have a healthy primary and secondary, the uh, cluster keeps being operational. So the architecture is very simple in that sense too. Uh, as long as you have two out of three of the instances running, your cluster uh, will always be operational. And then here's the other side of it. Uh, basically, PG Auto Failover supports Postgres versions 10 and upwards. So you have your client application connecting over libpq 10 plus after, uh, afterwards. And uh, in the connection string, you specify, hey, here are the machines that I want to connect to. And uh, if the primary fails and then the secondary gets promoted, uh, basically the application at the psql layer is going to detect that and then automatically fail over to the secondary. In summary, in short, uh, PG Auto uh, failover is a very simple way uh, to set up auto failover and HA for Postgres. The first version is just out, and then we actually do take HA very seriously, and we'd love your feedback. Uh, we have the GitHub repo here, in case you'd like to take a look at it. And uh, this actually, as to state, is the first project that we open sourced uh, as part of the Microsoft family, and you can read more about the announcement in here. Thank you.
that there was just us here. We were. <laughs> but welcome back. Yes. Yes, our next speaker is Dave Fuller. Yes. He's going to talk, I guess, about some something about slide cam pricing. Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. No, I, I needed this to be reusable. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, bad code is like swearing around children. Uh, Robin Williams had a special back in the 80s called Live at the Met, wherein he was talking about being a new father and driving around Los Angeles, and someone cut him off in traffic. And he said a bad word. And in the back seat, was his three-year-old son, who heard that bad word, and then spent the rest of the day repeating it, using it in sentences, conjugating it. Um, <laughs> and that what I want to impress upon you today is that bad code is like swearing around children. Some of the code you have written is bad. You should feel bad about this. Shame <laughs> is important. It could be like this. <laughs> <laughs> or this. Non-optimal piece of code. Or this. People new to programming, newer than you, will see what you do because they know you. You're smart. You're here today. You must be pretty smart. Doesn't mean you're wise. <laughs> Those newer programmers will look up to you and assume that what you have done must have been a good thing because you're smart. So um, they can't copy your code if they can't find your code. So you don't want newer programmers stumbling across, you know, a script like this because when they see that it empties a table, they might try to quit out of it. And you commented out the transaction and now you just lost a production table. Um, you definitely don't want them seeing your college era code. Um, don't, don't show them it. Uh, yeah, I always wanted to write my own in Chefferizer. This is the closest I got. Um, you wrote the code, you put effort into it. It works, it's still good. Did, why let it go to waste? We should leave that wisdom around. Consider these two little bits of code. This, the first one you wrote, and the second one you wrote later, possibly with the same function name, but it's more optimal. If one of these children sees these, the f at least the first one, they're going to use it because you're smart. You knew what you were doing when you wrote that. Um, dead code, code you're not using. It's wasting your time in compiling, in refactoring it, in your unit tests, and it just is being laid around where somebody who doesn't know what to do with it could find it. Um, I just finished a Python 2 to 3 upgrade at one of my clients, and a whole lot of the code we went through doesn't get run. I wonder how many hours I spent fixing code that no one actually uses. There are ways to make this better. Don't comment out code. Delete it. Deleted code is debugged code. It's still in GitHub. You've, you've got it. You can get it back. Just don't leave it around. So delete that function. You know, uh, Make a comment about why it was a bad thing, but don't leave it in the source file. When you're um, doing examples for other people, add in the days, today's date and the versions of all the tools you're using because time continues on after you write the post it, and the, what you wrote in that post may not be relevant in the future. You can't predict whether it will be or not, so put in a marker like this that helps people understand where you were when you made this advice. When you are deleting the code or when you can't uh, get rid of things or when you can't make the update that you want to make because there isn't time, at least record your regrets in an issue tracker of some sort so that somebody can get around to it. 
In summary, bad code is like swearing around children. If you don't pay attention to what you're letting them see, they'll just say, fuck it. So it seems Dan didn't think running a conference was enough work. Uh, so you're also going to do a talk? Yes. Okay. A very short talk. So how many of you type things into a computer or a laptop? How many of you do that? Oh, come on. Be brave. How many of you do that on more than one laptop or machine? More than three. OK. How many times have you written something somewhere and not been able to find it because you can't remember where you wrote it? OK, that's what this solves. <coughs> Sync thing is like, where's the, where's the clicker? This clicker? Yeah. This clicker, OK. Yeah. There we go. So syn sync thing hits all the buttons. Um, I've got it running at home. Uh, it basically syncs my uh, documents directory, but you can make it sync whatever directories you want. And it's not like our sync, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So what uh, my solution involves is having three systems running sync thing. My laptop, my laptop, my other laptop, and a server, that's actually four. The reason I have the server doing that is because not all the laptops have to be on at the same time in order for this to work, just the server. So whatever laptop's on syncs to the server, and then whenever another laptop comes along, it syncs to the server as well. So when you install it and get it running, uh, it pops up a little web page on, on the computer you're running, and you can have a look at it. And in my case, uh, what was the focus button? I had a red button here somewhere, there. So that's one of my laptops, that's my server, that's the laptop it's running on. And with, this is about 20, how many? I can't remember. There's something like 212 directories, 2,600 files, and 60 gig. The initial sync takes a while, but after that, it's very low CPU. It's doing like 0.23% at the moment. Um, and now I don't have to worry about where I wrote something. It's always in my documents folder, and it doesn't matter where it is. Um, the advantage to syncing it to this, ser this server at home, this server here, is that this is running on a ZFS snapshot, it gets snapshot, it gets backed up, it gets replicated to other locations. So I think it's very difficult for me to lose my documents directory accidentally. And that one. Any questions? In the back, there's one over here. No. It, 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 this is not about repos, this is just about plain flat text files, for example. Uh, you could have your source files in here and it would sync the source files somewhere else, but it won't, it, it'll also sync the git directories, but I don't think that's what you want. Yeah. Any other questions? Here. Wh what's the source? Just set. I'm trying to answer that. Yeah, there's syncthing.net. I thought I had another slide. <laughs> I think it's on my other laptop. <laughs> I think I added that and didn't upload it. So syncthing.net, you can get it there. Uh, they have various packages and stuff like that that works. We have another minute and a half. I do, I do. <laughs> but I'm going to finish if there's no more questions. Okay, thank you.
that's your format, and that's your advanced one. Left and right. Okay, so our next speaker is Renee. She's going to talk about the D and I part of the day. I have no idea what that means, but I think she can tell me. Uh, diversity and inclusion. Now I know what it is. Now we all know. Um, so an acquaintance of mine, uh, Sumana Hariharswara, was... Uh, talking with me at Bang Bang Con, and she said, yeah, you know, all of the marginalized uh, background people that I met feel like they have to give the DNI talk. And I was like, yeah, I'm looking forward to not being uh, the person to do it, but here I am volunteering again. Uh, I'm Renee Phillips. I'm based in New York. We're in Ottawa. Did I get that right? Good. Um, so we all work with people, no matter if it's you know a million years ago, today, ordering things from Amazon, getting delivery on food, sending mail, working alone in a cubicle. There are people around us in our lives, even if we're unemployed, we're still working uh, cooperatively with people in some way. So this is something that applies to everybody, so we should all be awake and concerned about this, so thank you for staying. I am very annoyed by these two books and many other things that often come up in the DNI world. And what these two books in particular do is they say, hey, ladies, and it's generally focused on ladies, um, and, a, and a very particular kind of lady, uh, very middle class, very white, very able bodied. Um, but it says, hey, ladies, here's how you fix your DNI problem. And I'm here to tell you that this is not my problem, this is our problem. So we all can do things to help, and I'm gonna give you three things to think about and do. Bathrooms, complaints, and hiring. I called this talk uh, Complaints About Bathrooms and Auditions. Uh, so we want everybody to come to our spaces. We want people to feel welcome. We want people to participate. We want the ideas of people who don't look or speak or sound or walk or talk like us. Um, and that includes not just gender. This includes race, first language, abilities, whether that's physical or neurotypical or other biological types of things. We want people to be able to get into our spaces, stay there, be comfortable, and get more people into our spaces. Uh, so complaining about bathrooms, um, I will cry at work. I would prefer not to have to cry in the bathroom. I really don't want you to tell me not to cry at work. Um, I want all of us to be able to cry at work. If your dog dies, you should be allowed to cry about that. Uh, if you stub your toe and you're in physical pain, you should be allowed to cry about that. So my crying at work hopefully will open the door for all of you to cry at work. If I do have to cry in the bathroom, I want the bathroom to be uh, a reasonable and safe place to be for everybody. So things that you can all do at work is if you notice or hear that your workplace is having menstrual supplies in the women's room, maybe mention to your workplace that they might include having those supplies in the men's room because people have all kinds of genders, um, gender representations, gender identities, gender feelings, might be menstruating in the men's room, need those supplies. So that's one thing that you can do. Just suggest to your boss, you did this thing in one place, please be equitable and do it in another place because one of the most dangerous things for a, a trans man to do who, and I hate to use the word passing, but someone who is has passing privilege to out themselves and say, hey, I need a tampon, that could be really dangerous. So if you just put them there and then don't ask any questions, yay. This is especially great if you're holding interviews or social events at your office. People can see, hey, this is an equitable place to work. If they don't want to work in a place that is an equitable place to work, great, you just scared off a jerk. If they are people who need or want accommodations or will appreciate those accommodations, great, you just encourage them to be there. More bathroom stuff. This is a Marcel Duchamp uh, piece of art. It's a urinal. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of reasons getting into the complaint thing that people don't make complaints. Here's a list of them. Here's a list of responses we often get when we make complaints or bring up concerns. The list is very long. Uh, there are a lot of things that give cover for terrible people to continue doing terrible things. When someone comes to you at work, whether you're in a position of power or not, listen and don't invalidate their concerns. Maybe help the person make a plan, maybe say that sucks. If you overhear something terrible happening, Make a code of conduct complaint. Even if that terrible conduct wasn't addressed at you, you can still report it. 
finally, auditions. We know that blind auditions work. So if you're in a workplace that's hiring, please encourage your workplace to anonymize resumes. There are great ways to do this. We know from musicians that truly anonymous um, audition practices have helped putting carpets down. Talk to me if you have questions. talk speaker for today. I hope if anyone else is planning to give a lightning talk, I missed it, so you're not doing it. Um, <laughs> Julian is going to talk about POA. Hi. So I want to talk about uh, POA 4, which is obviously the first version of POA. So probably you don't know about this tool. Uh, quick introduction. Uh, what it does, it's uh, uh, POA is an acronym for a Postgres Workload Analyzer. So what it does is uh, help you to give some insight on uh, your workload, on your databases, on a more or less uh, real-time uh, fashion. So the idea is uh, you can take a snapshot on uh, various uh, uh, data sources. So the first one is obviously PG stat statements, and you can get a lot of really uh, useful uh, counters like number of execution and everything. Uh, but there are support for uh, a lot of other extensions. Uh, one of my favorite one is a PG weight sampling, which uh, is available for PG 10 and above. So it's uh, what this extension does is uh, sample weight events at a high frequency, and it's super cool. So uh, you can uh, use that to have uh, insight of weight events. Uh, you can also get uh, information about CPU usage and physical disk uh, usage with uh, another extension, which is uh, called PGStat Kcash. Uh, you can also uh, sample predicates, so the where clause and the join clauses, uh, to have more information like uh, what index are missing and everything. Uh, then you store everything in a Postgres database, obviously, you retrieve it, and then the UI gives you a lot of uh, nice, uh, I hope, dashboards to see everything. And there is also, since the last version, uh, a wizard, which kind of do uh, a global analysis of everything happened on one database. database and try to come up with a, um, a global index suggestion, which try to um, get the uh, smallest amount of uh, indexes uh, to create, to um, uh, optimize uh, your workload uh, by uh, trying to get as much uh, multi index to, to avoid too many index and stuff like that. Uh, so the Interesting thing is the uh, first version is uh, there is now a remote mode, which means you don't have to store everything on your production database and make everything even slower. So that's uh, a nice thing uh, to add. Uh, it's also work on a standby. So there is a graph, which doesn't mean a lot, but you can see a lot of fancy things. There is documentation if you are interested, so you can uh, see everything and on the project. Uh, some screenshots, because it's much more fun. So uh, you see, uh, you have uh, on the UI multiple instances you can uh, uh, um, collect on one database. So you can choose whatever instance you want to, to drill down to see what's happening. So you have a uh, system metrics uh, with uh, pgstat kcash. So you can see uh, the context switches and the uh, patch faults and uh, stuff like that. So you, you have that at the per query, per database, and per server uh, level. So it's quite nice. I don't think there is another way to have that for now on Postgres. Uh, you can also have the CPU usage, once again, per query, per uh, instance, and per database. So uh, it's a nice way to see if you have like a system uh, CPU usage or uh, user CPU usage. So it's also uh, nice to see if you're missing something in your like C code or function or whatever. Uh, still, with the same extension, you can compute a real uh, hit ratio, which means you can see what was in the shared buffer in the uh, operating system cache and uh, just read on disk. So it can help you to tune like, oh, you're missing some shared buffer or mm, index because you're reading too much from disk or whatever. Uh, another extension I didn't mention in uh, PG track settings, which can track uh, whatever change happened 
on your uh, server, and then you can put some uh, some dots and see what what setting change uh, at one point. So you can see if like uh, if you put your work time from uh, one gigabyte to one megabyte, and everything suddenly is super slow, you can see what change and uh, how it changed on your graph. So probably can help you to uh, drill down whatever change was effective or not. Uh, the white event I was talking about, so you can see a graph of everything happening and a, a, a chart with uh, the number of logs. So uh, in this case, you can see transaction ID is the uh, highest one. So probably it was a PG bench doing a lot of uh, small inserts. So you just waiting on that. Uh, the global index suggestion. So uh, it's a big picture with probably you can't see a lot, but it just, you can see here like uh, a lot of queries and just like these four index trying to uh, optimize all those queries and saying one index can optimize uh, six queries, so it can be nice. Uh, reference, you have all the links and there is an online uh, demo available. And thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to all of our Lightning Talk speakers. Uh, that's it for today at this venue. Um, some of you will probably want to join us at the social events, which somebody in the audience will now tell me when it begins. Six o'clock. Uh, those of you who don't do that, we'll see you all again for the second day tomorrow. Thank you much. Thank you.